you know, next to between hand and up and share, there's a yeah. three I dots. Three dots, right. When I, when I click the three dots, device settings, meeting details, gallery together, focus, full screen, call me, apply background effects, turn on live captions, dial pad, turn off incoming video. Huh. Okay, I well, I'm Karen, recording it right now. She's unable to see it, so maybe uh, Michelle and I'm I can also. Recording it. Okay, yeah. She's recording it. Okay, good. I see that it is being recorded. I'm going to mute myself now. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. So, how many people are coming? There's an FC. Who is FC? There's a DD and FC. Chen. Uh, Chen. Uh, Feng. Feng. Hi, this is a phone. Oh, hello, Feng. How are you? Hi, Bawadi. How are you? I'm fine. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So Feng is a brilliant data scientist. Thank you. Yeah, he's very good. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Dowski is here as well. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yes, hello. Yes, I'm here too. <laughs> hello. I put on a, 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 a shirt and a tie and, a, and so I'm Mm -hmm. Oh, Dr. DT is here. I put on makeup. Hey, good evening. Oh, hello, DT. Hey, <coughs> Hi. So I'm just talking to all my friends. <laughs> That's good. So, Pushpa, have you all yeah. recorded all of the previous lectures? I don't think my first one was recorded. No. No, Bhavani, no. Those were not recorded, but Michelle used to take down notes and she would mm -hmm. capture the stories. I have it on audio recording, like maybe. Okay. It's from so long so when ago. Did, when do we start recording then? We'll start when you start talking. I know okay. mine's recording right now, so. Oh, you are, yours is okay. Pushpa, do you have the ability to mute everyone except Bhavani? Uh, I have a mute all, but if I click mute all, I think it will mute Bhavani as well. I think she can personally unmute herself after she that. can. But I want Dr. DT to welcome the audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So once that is done, I will mute all them. Sounds good. Why do you want to mute everyone? Oh, that's Farooq Bastani, Professor Bastani. Yeah. Oh, hey, good afternoon. <laughs> um, because I just heard someone opening a candy bar and it made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's no, no connection to but muting everyone. <laughs> there's background noise that could interrupt. Or oh, that I agree, I agree. In my class it happens once in a while, yeah. But you can mute them all. So, but no, they uh, after just a few seconds, they realize it and they take mm -hmm. care of it. That's good. OK, I'll mute. But also just to let you know, when I logged in, I was automatically muted. <laughs> well, so that's the, good. the default is to be muted. That's a good idea. So Bhavani, you will uh, you have the presentation at your end, right? Yes. Yes, I do. So when I share it, I'm, I've got it. And then when I click, yeah, so when I do this, then I think my presentation, yeah, I'll share my desktop. Okay, good. Uh, where are these? Oh, gosh. I'm going to put all this out and then share the desktop. But before I share, I before I share it, yeah, I just want to be, yeah. So I'm, I'm all set. All right, thanks, Bhavan. Oh, there's Rhonda. Gigi. Hello. Gupta is here. Yeah, Gigi is Gopal Gupta. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Dr. Gupta. Hi, Bhavan. Hi. Hi. Oh, hello, Norma. Norma Hi, everyone. Here. I thought mm. someone said. No, no, this is Mera. I said hi to everyone. Oh, Mera. Okay. Hi, Mera. Oh, hi. No, I saw DT. Yeah, I see DT yeah, as well. 
I asked Arifat to join, and then his wife was my PhD student. If she doesn't join, I'll be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> Today is AAAI deadline, so a lot of people are probably busy writing papers. September 9th, right? Yeah. So is Dr. DT here? Yeah, uh, let me know when I should start. I think we can start right now. So I'm going to switch okay. to the slideshow mode and then let's start the okay, talk. Okay, sure. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the fall 2020 Grace Lecture Series. This Women Empowerment Lecture Series inaugurated back in spring 2015 has included several speakers on UTD campus, especially from the CS department. And under the leadership of several CS faculty, in particular, Dr. Pushpa Kuma and Dr. Karandua, the series has had over 20 inspirational lectures over the years. And the CS department very much appreciates the effort of the series organizers to provide stimulating talks to our students and faculty. Well, we wish you all a very successful semester. Back to you, Pushpa. Okay, thank you, Dr. DT. And uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge once again uh, Dr. Gopal Gupta, uh, who was very instrumental in getting the series started uh, back in 2015 spring, and also Dr. DT right now, who has stepped up to welcome the talk, uh, the speakers, as well as giving us motivation to continue the series forward. I would also uh, like to acknowledge Michelle, who's here, and she's ready to capture the recording and capture the story as well and Dr. Bhavani Thurasingam for all her time, and also Norma Richardson for setting up this meeting. So this is our 27th Gray Series talk, and this is our first Gray Series virtual talk. And without any further delay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Bhavani Thurasingam. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce her. So Dr. Bhavani Thurasingam is the Founders Chair Professor of Computer Science and the Executive Director of the Cybersecurity Research and the Education Institute at UTD. She's an elected fellow of the ACM, IEEE, the AAAS, and the NAI. Her research interests are on integrating cybersecurity and artificial intelligence data science for the past 35 years. She has received several awards, including the IEEE CS 1997 Technical Achievement Award, the ACM SIGSAC 2010 Outstanding Contributions Award, the IEEE COMSOC Communications and Information Security 2019 Technical Recognition Award, and the ACM COD ASP 2017 Lasting Research Award. Her work has resulted in 130 plus journal articles, 300 plus conference papers, 170 plus keynote and featured addresses, and six, six US patents and 15 books. So without further delay, once again, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bhavani Thurasingam to our first Gray Series virtual talk. So take it over, Bhavani. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pushpa, for giving that wonderful introduction. And thank you very much, Dr. D.T. Hyun, for you know, hosting this uh, event or supporting this event. And also some others I would like to talk, of course, uh, Michelle, Ms. Michelle Possimantia for doing all of our wonderful write-ups for us, and Norma Richardson for inviting me together with uh, Pushpa and Dr. Karen, and then Rhonda Walls uh, for working with me and our team, and also everyone else. So I'm just I'm really honored to give this talk for the second time. So I gave the kickoff presentation back in. Uh, April 19, sorry, nine, April 2015, that was the first Grace presentation. And uh, that was when 
I had gotten sort of my second phase of being involved with women, women diversity and inclusion because I have been involved with this since around 1998, 1999, you know, addressing Society for Women Engineers as well as women in, uh, I mean, career communications as for African Americans. Um, so I was participating in that and also giving talks at uh, uh, that all girls uh, college university, I think Smith College uh, in Massachusetts, um, as well as Women in Technology International in North Carolina. So I, I was doing some events off and on, but I really got started in a way latter part of 2014 and in particular 2015 uh, April when uh, Dr. Gupta and, uh, and Pushpa and uh, Norma, they invited me to give the, uh, the kickoff address uh, for the Grace series. So at that time, I talked about my story, how I went from uh, industry, Honeywell, to Federal Research Lab, MITRE, to government, NSF, and then I came to academia, which is UT Dallas. And so today, and it's th this particular talk is especially uh, important for me and motivating because we are, you know, working under very difficult situations, right? With COVID-19, we are all working from home. And so it is not easy. And so I really enjoy and appreciate that much more, you know, giving the talks from home than say coming to university and giving a talk like I did in April 2015. I was appreciative then as well, but I think it's probably I feel like 10 times more grateful uh, for being given the opportunity to give this uh, give this presentation. OK, so now I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, how do I get this done? Go to the desktop. Or should, should I go here? Oh, OK, uh, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, Bhavani, we can okay. see. OK, so Pushpa, you are recording, right? OK, yes. so there are two parts to my talk. First part is more technical. That's the work I'm doing right now on integrating cybersecurity and AI slash data science. And the second part is more diversity and inclusion. And so both talks, I have given both aspects of this presentation, so I'm not combining the two. So actually the first part of the talk itself could be like one hour, 60 to 90 minutes, but I'm sort of cutting it down to max 30 minutes or maybe less. And the second part of the talk, I gave it at Cyber W, ACM Cyber W, which is Women in Cybersecurity Research. I also gave that at WISE, Women in Communications Engineering and uh, Women in Services Computing, so various events. So I've taken bits and pieces but now I'm including it more than just women, diversity and inclusion. OK, so there are two different parts and I'm sort of connecting the second one to the first one. Why we should have more women and also diverse groups from diverse, diverse uh, diversity communities to conduct research, development and work in cybersecurity and data science. As Pushpa mentioned, I've been working in these areas since 1985 when I joined Honeywell. Um, that's 35 years ago. And at that time it was called computer science, uh, sorry, computer security and data science was data management. Although AI was still there, our AI at the time was just developing expert systems. So I was one of the first to develop a secure database system uh, for the US Air Force as part of a team. And then in the area of AI, when I was at Honeywell, we developed an expert system for control systems. So we've published a couple of papers in that area. Uh, our expert system, how it uh, gave advice to the operators who were operating the control systems. Honeywell was a control systems company, and in particular control system was TDC 3000, Industrial Automation Control System. In the area of data science, uh, my initial work was on integrating all of these heterogeneous databases 
for Honeywell's division, in particular, the residence, residential control division. So we built a data dictionary and integrated these different schemas, and we used sort of an entity relationship model uh, as the global model. So I've been doing work in all of these three areas since 1985. Uh, so anyway, so that's first part. Second part is why should women and minority communities get into cybersecurity? And when I say data science, it's AI slash data science. Okay, so the talk, cybersecurity and data science, uh, I'm going to give you some motivation why uh, how we got into this area and then big data security and privacy. So I've got sort of one or two charts on each of these topics. So this is really the class I'm teaching, a flagship class that I'm teaching this semester from NSF funding. So that work has been funded entirely starting from actually 2014 when we had the workshop. Then we uh, developed this capacity development project and that was funded, I believe, in 2016-17 to develop some experiments and also uh, have this course. So that's what I'm teaching now. And then there was another small project on privacy aware quantified self. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then a lot of our work, especially with Latifa. Latifa is like the world's expert on applying data science or one of the experts on applying data science for cybersecurity, in particular streaming data. And then that's with Latifer and the other work, Murat's the main expert there on adversarial machine learning. So I've contributed a little bit to that area. And then, of course, what are the directions? OK, so that's the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk, as I said, about eight charts on diversity and inclusion. And uh, there, a lot of our work started with also organize two, three, two things that really helped me there. One is organizing the WISTIS, Women in Cybersecurity. And we organized an 800 person conference in Dallas. And Rhonda was, you know, really organizing and doing lots of stuff for us. So that gave us a lot of visibility among the female community uh, and also got, a, you know, good points with NSF. And the other is, so I do that now. I'm going to do more and more events with Dr. Ebru. On, unfortunately, she said she couldn't, uh, she couldn't come today. She was, she was teaching. And then the other area is women in data science. And that was like a huge uh, visibility uh, that I got when Stanford University invited me to give a talk at their annual women in data science. Uh, that was... Uh, watched by over 100,000 people according to Forbes magazine. So again, being at Stanford and being interviewed by the media and giving the talk and also being in the panel, that got me a lot of visibility also uh, for women, you know, with that community, women in data science. Okay, so for our research, we have a number of sponsors, NSF, Army, Air Force, uh, NASA, and also NSA. And as I said, my colleagues, and I'm grateful also to Rhonda. Okay, so what was the motivation? How did this all start? So I believe that it was myself back in 1996, because not many people were talking about this before. Uh, everybody was starting to sort of jump on the bandwagon data mining. Because remember, machine learning was really big sort of in the 1970s and the 80s. Everything kind of vanished a bit because we really didn't know how to do data. But then in the late 80s, early 90s, we really knew how to you know, manage databases. And so we were now able to manage terabytes of data. We were beginning to look at petabytes of data. So I was very involved with the intelligence community on that effort. And so there was a lot of work on data mining, applying it for a number of applications. But then there was some concern. What about the security and uh, and privacy? OK, so without a doubt, data mining was helping with security. But one of the concerns that I had was you can put collections of pieces of data together and then infer something that is highly sensitive, highly private. And with data mining, 
Uh, right, so data mining today is, you know, you can think of it as data science because data mining is kind of a bad word. I'll tell you why it's so bad. Okay, so data mining, uh, you can dig in and extract a lot of information, but putting all the information together, you can infer something that is highly private. So I gave a keynote address and mentioned about the privacy concerns first at the IFIP conference in um, Como, Italy in 1996. And at that time I was managing a department at MITRE, MITRE Corporation. And so I also hired Dr. Chris Clifton, who is now at Purdue to conduct research. And so he was also working with NSA. And so we did a lot of work. Um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but some work I would say on data privacy. Right, so people were beginning to get uh, you know, concerned about privacy. And then at the Pacific Asia Knowledge Discovery Conference, I gave a similar keynote and that was in Melbourne, Australia and talked about the privacy concerns. And then I published, I call it, I'll tell you why I call it a landmark paper, because I was a program director at NSF. It was now soon after 9-11, right? Because 96 and 98, this was before 9-11. So soon after 9-11, I went to NSF and there was a lot of interest on data mining for counterterrorism. So there was, you know, intelligence community, national science, and there were other agencies. And so I gave a talk at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and United Nations on data mining for counterterrorism. But then there were people who were getting very concerned about privacy because DARPA had a program at the time called terrorism aware terrorism information awareness. And so Admiral Poindexter, who was in charge of the program, that very famous or infamous Ad Admiral Poindexter, uh, however you want to think, you know, he was working, I think, for the uh, Reagan administration. And then there was all the Contra scandals and so on. I don't have those details. But anyway, he had made a statement at some conference that we are going to collect the information of all the all the US citizens and we want to find out where they are traveling, what they are doing. So of course there was a big concern. And so Diane Feinstein and Feingold, Russ Feingold, they were two senators, they passed a bill. And I believe at that time there was a moratorium on data mining. Uh, so anyway, at that time I published a paper, I call it landmark because when you're an NSF program director and when you write a paper, of course, it gets many citations and everyone wants to talk about it. So I believe that spawned a new area of research, uh, privacy preserving data mining. Now, I didn't coin the word privacy preserving data mining. The guy from IBM, Rakesh Agrawal and Chris Clifton from Purdue, they were the ones who were, I would say, really pioneers in privacy preserving data mining. So because of all the privacy, right? So data mining became a bad word. Okay, so we're not supposed to use and data mining changed to data analytics until we got data science and now machine learning. Okay, so what is privacy preserving data mining essentially? So you have the original data and you perturb it slightly, right? Randomize it or you can use um, perturb it or randomize, introduce some random values, and so add some noise. And so you get X prime is when the noise is added. And now you have the modified data mining process, and then you get the final modified result. And you have to randomize it or perturb it in such a way that the end result should be more or less the same. Because what's the point in doing data mining if you know the end result is something that is deviating completely, right? When you do privacy preserving data mining. So that was a situation when I came to UT Dallas. So my initial work was to, you know, get a student, Dr. Lee Liu, uh, to focus on privacy preserving uh, data mining. So she was getting some interesting results. It was that time that Dr. Murat Kantajulu joined us. So I also asked Dr. Murat, OK, let's work together on that. And so we came up with something called privacy preserving decision trees. OK, so this was all like between 2000, around between 2005 to 2008. And Dr. Murat's PhD was also in this area. He came up with something called secure multi-party computation, right? Each one of us, we have a secret. Uh, we don't tell each other what the secret is, but we encrypt the secret and put it into a basket. The algorithm, the privacy preserving algorithm will take all our secrets, work with the encrypted data and what happens in the end, it will uh, do the mining or do the analytics 
and then come up with the result, decrypt the results. So we'll all know the end results, like say people who live in Brownsville, Texas, have a higher incidence of, you know, getting diabetes. OK, so so that was a lot of interesting work. Now, has it gone into commercial products? So in, in a way, yes, because uh, OK, let's finish the last. So data mining, security and privacy is exacerbated with big data and data science, because now you've got massive amounts of data collected, retained, managed and so on. So UT Dallas hosted an NSF workshop on big data security and privacy into the latter part of 2014. And we got a lot of visibility. Uh, the NSF program, actually Chris Clifton wanted me to come and present it to all of the, uh, the program directors uh, in Washington. So there was DARPA program directors and there were several others who were there. And so I went and presented it to all of them, the results of the workshop. But uh, OK, so one of the things I wanted to mention, you could ask the question that is this. Let me switch off my phone. OK, so the question is, is this something uh, that is being used practical, right? Does it have practical applications? So one thing to note is after the initial work, several groups were looking at measuring uh, privacy. So Latania Sweeney, she's she was the chief. She's at Harvard. She's the she was the chief technology officer at uh, uh, let's say the Federal Trade Commission. She came up with something called uh, not L diversity. I think she came up with some measure uh, for you know, OK anonymity. So I'm not going to go into the details. And then some someone else came up with L diversity. Then Cynthia Doak, a lady uh, at Microsoft, came up with the uh, differential privacy and some aspects of her work I hear they have gone into the our iPhones. OK, so I don't have too many details on that particular exactly which pieces of her work went in, but that is what I heard. So there's still a lot of work uh, on data privacy. OK, so now we are now into like 2014 15. So we finished all of that, you know, privacy preserving data mining. And remember I mentioned data mining was a bad word. So when I was in, two, in 2009, DHS asked me to give a talk and I was told by the contractor, I think Accenture, talk about data mining for, uh, for uh, you know, catching the bad guys. So I went and gave the talk. So someone at DHS kind of got upset and said, we do not know, do data mining here. What we do is if somebody, you know, See, data mining means you can dig in and find uncovered. Like, so even innocent people could be uh, could be examined. So what he said was what we do is if somebody else, some other agency tells us that, say, Bhavani is a suspicious lady, we need to check on her, then they will do some extra checks on me, right? They won't dig in and then just look at pick me up randomly and then do some um, some investigation. So anyway, so Privacy is still a big area. Privacy preserving, you know, data analytics. Now it's called uh, a more uh, appropriate word is privacy preserving data science, privacy preserving uh, machine learning. So privacy preserving whatever, but not privacy preserving data mining. But it's more or less sort of the same thing. OK, so now we are in the big big data area, right? So. So my class covers, you know, a lot of concepts here. So our workshop that we organize big data management, security and privacy. So the whole point here is that now it's possible to collect lots and lots of data and we can capture the data, process, analyze large amounts of data uh, for various tasks. It could be security tasks, it could be healthcare, especially COVID-19, it could be financial data. There is a lot of big data now being applied for Wall Street trading applications, uh, big data analytics, so the, for, from a security point of view, we can use big data analytics for user authentication, access control, anomaly detection. That's what we focus on quite a bit, anomaly. User monitoring protections from inside the threat. I'll talk about inside the threat. So we analyze large amounts of data collected on the web or otherwise we can identify connections and relationships and disease outbreaks and all kinds of stuff. Collected data, even if anonymized, you can remove the identifiers, but the, this is a challenge. When you link all the data, even if you remove the identifiers, when you link the data, 
right? You can get, uh, you can re-identify the individuals. That's a challenge we are faced with. And security tasks such as authentication, uh, access control, they require detailed information about the users, like multi-factor authentication. So the problem, if this information is stolen, it can lead to privacy breaches. And what are some of the directions? So we looked at access control models, especially for big data. So my class on Friday is going to talk about three different access control models for big data and privacy enhanced techniques, big data analytics for cybersecurity. So at UTD, uh, much of our focus actually is on privacy enhanced techniques. And Murad does some work on access control and Latifa does a lot of work on big data for cybersecurity. One drawback at that workshop we did not address what happens if the big data techniques are attacked, right? What happens if the machine learning techniques are attacked? That part we did not cover. But today, that area is actually one of the hottest topics. In fact, Murat and his team, they were the first or among the first to do research in that area. But now all of the top institutions like, you know, Stanford and Berkeley and um, all, you know, I'm not so sure about MIT, but mm, especially Berkeley has really pushed and Carnegie Mellon, they have really pushed, you know, what happens if the machine learning techniques are attacked and Murat also is continuing and doing some very good, very good work in that area. Okay, so the other project, okay, so one, one offshoot of that particular work, we had a small NSF grant, it was like quite a few years ago, to look at privacy aware, policy based quantified self. So sociologists and psychologists have come up with this quantified self movement that is trying to gather lots of data about individuals so that you can store the data and analyze the data and not for privacy point of view, but just give some useful results because we would like to get all of our data and give us tips about healthcare, you know, that you, that I could get, say, maybe some sort of cancer or diabetes or things like that. So give us advice. But of course, when you start doing that, then the privacy you know, is going to be violated. So, so in our work, what we said was we had all of the health related data, the fitness data, location data, social media, images, other sources. And we, this is the framework that we developed is data collection, data storage and access, data analytics, data sharing. And we didn't do all of it together. We didn't integrate, but we did bits and pieces, right? So data analytics was right, our area. Data collection was actually, Purdue was focusing on that. Data sharing was something we were focusing. And so all the backed up data, it was stored in the cloud, encrypted backup data. And then you have these cloud based services where you can anonymize some of the data. And so the whole idea is to be able to query the anonymized data. And we call this the privacy aware quantified self manager, and it would typically run on a mobile device. So this is the, this was the goal for us to, you know, completely, you know, develop the idea was to integrate all of these pieces, but for the project, we didn't really promise that we will integrate. We talked about the different designs and eventually, hopefully somebody will come and take our designs and you know do the integration, some company. Okay, so that is the privacy aware. So what we are saying, the interesting part is that every step of the way, you can't just randomly collect, uh, collect data, store data, analyze data, share data. Every step of the way, we need appropriate policies. And remember, we computer scientists in, in working in cybersecurity and data security, we have developed various types of policies from the time I started working in cybersecurity and since 1985. But these policies are really toy, T-O-Y, policies, right? We say, okay, I will share something with you provided you don't share it with Jane, or I share something with you provided you share something with me. But that's not the way the real world works. Real world works with some real world policies, so we really need policy specialists to work on that. So we had someone, I believe, uh, at uh, Purdue who was also working out with some real world policies. 
But more recently, we have collaborations with uh, Dr. Jennifer Holmes. She's the Dean of EPS. She's a top-notch policy expert. And when I say we, Alvaro and Jennifer have had some joint projects when Alvaro was here, Alvaro Cardenas, uh, to look at policies for the power grid. And so Jennifer will come up with the policies and then Alvaro will look at examine those policies and see whether they are viable. And that was something they did in Colombia, the country Colombia. And now Latifa is working with Jennifer now uh, and Patrick on coming up with political science uh, and using data science for political science and not looking at privacy in that particular project, but Jennifer is helping out with policy. So my story here is that when we work with policies, you know, let's work with some real world, you know, people who are developing some real policies. OK, so that's the message here. OK, so that's the, the privacy aware quantified self. So that's that project. Now I want to move on to data science for cybersecurity applications. So that is the data stream classification. And so Latifa and I was quite involved actually in the early days of Dr. this project. Dr. Tresinger, yes, so, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, but so far I could only see the first slide of your talk. Oh dear. Is that problem with everyone or is it only me? Same for me. Oh yeah. gosh. OK, so, so I'm so sorry. I will be, no, okay. no, that why happened in my class once. I don't know why it let, happens. Let me, OK, so I, OK, let me, let me start again. OK, maybe this is what I need to do. OK. But can you see now? Yeah, Bhavani, we can see now. OK, so I'm no, going no. to switch. Go, go to the next. Let's see if we can see. I think you should be able to, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. It works. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. I, I'm so sorry. This is the first chart I showed you all, right? Very quickly, I'll, I'm going to go through because, okay, so this was the outline I talked about, okay? Then I talked about the, remember the motivation, data mining, security, privacy. So we have, you know, adding the original and then we add the noise and the modified process. So this is that chart, okay? Data mining, security, and privacy. And also I talked about what I did at NSF and uh, and various things. And then the third chart, so you all didn't really miss as much. So big data, security and privacy, that was all words, you know, what we were doing uh, in the area of big data and the workshop. And this was the, the previous chart I mentioned. So I only um, had, I know I talked for almost half an hour, but it was only four charts. That's privacy aware, policy based, quantified self. So we had all of this data coming in, and then we have the data collection, data storage, analytic sharing, and then some of the data is going to be in the cloud. And this is the privacy aware, quantified manager. So we had every step of the way collection, storage, analytic sharing, policies have to guide. That's what I was saying. Okay, so these are the four charts. Now we get to the next one, chart number six, uh, because the cover was the first one. OK, so now we talk about data science for cybersecurity, right? So stream classification. So when we were doing data mining, right, throughout the 90s, when we were doing data mining, we only developed one model, right? As the data was coming in, we didn't have real time models. And so we just developed one model and then that model would soon get outdated. So we could not do data mining for real time data. And in fact, my boss at NSF uh, was um, Michael Pazani. He was really urging the, and he's a machine learning, one of the top machine learning experts, at least at that time. He was telling um, the, the PIs, you know, especially when they came for IBM, I, sorry, IDM PI meetings, just focus on real time data mining and so you know we are talking about like almost 10 years later we were able to look at streaming data so this is jointly with J.W. Hahn uh, at University of Illinois uh, and Latifa also teams with Charu Agrawal from IBM uh, T.J. Watson so there's lots of data coming in 
and then you build a classification model. And then what happens, of course, the attack traffic comes in, and then if it's attack data, then you block and quarantine, otherwise it's benign traffic. And then periodically, as new data comes in, you look at the concepts because as new data comes in, right, it's continuous flow of data and the, the concepts may be changing. So that is the challenge. So what we did was we had multiple models. As the data comes in, we have multiple models we develop. And sometimes if the models are not valid, the old models, we throw away the old models and then we select the, keep the new models. So that's the whole idea. Another very unique thing that I just wanted to mention that Latifer, uh, a little bit myself, I contributed, but also J. V. Han, but it was really Latifer's work. He did something called novel class detection, and that is detecting uh, classes that are new, because typically when you apply, you know, data science techniques, right, you can get red class or blue class or green class, but there could be a class that's mashed up with red, blue and green, sort of class X, Y, J or something. And so you developed a technique where you put all the instances that you cannot classify into a buffer and over time you are able to classify it and then you get the class X, Y, J. So these are some of the techniques that were developed and applied to cybersecurity. Why is novel class interesting? Because with novel class detection, you will be able to detect those classes like zero day attacks. That's the biggest challenge we have. So we did test with some of the data and were able to detect some of these new classes, but especially for non-security applications like working with NASA, it worked really well. But unfortunately for security applications in the unclassified world, we did not have the real world data, right? So as a result, we didn't, you know, we couldn't really test. We didn't have enough data to train as well as to test. But the good news is that we gave some of our, the software and the code and so on to the Air Force, yeah, because part of the research was also funded by Air Force. Uh, and hopefully they would have, and Latifa also helped them with uh, with this code, and so hopefully they would have used it on some you know useful data. So that's where this particular work. And so this was Pavin uh, Pavin Palabi, my PhD student. She applied this novel class detection technique for insider th threat detection. Right? You know we know what insider threat is, where people you know, behave like, you know, they pretend to be good people, but they are really bad people. So like Ames from the CIA or Hansen from uh, from FBI, you know, they were caught with espionage, right? Giving all our secrets to the Russians. But we were looking at processes inside the system, right? Good processes, processes that are pretending to be good, but they are really bad. So we applied whatever techniques and novel class. So we have you know, broke up the data into chunks. So data is arriving into chunks. So we develop models for each chunk. As a new chunk comes in, if it doesn't fit in, then or if it's if the concept has changed, then some of the chunks, the models are thrown away. And then we have some new models. So constantly the models are changing. Uh, things like uh, the, the, the algorithms that we were using were support vector machines. And then, of course, K I plus I plus one chunk comes in. So the, the same thing with machine learning, you know, you train and then you test. But the interesting point here is that the concepts are changing and therefore we are continuously uh, adapting and changing the models. OK, so that's so we had some very good results on insider threat detection, and this entire project was funded by Air Force. So the initial work started with NASA and then it went into you know air force and so they funded quite a bit and lots of algorithms were developed and we didn't have a lot of the test data so we we're generating a lot of the data we couldn't we couldn't we didn't have really the actual data like we had for nasa but we transferred all of these algorithms and the systems to the air force so so this work is still continuing and he's still getting quite a bit of funding from there. And today he got some small grant from NIST to continue with this work. This is a lot of his work. OK, so this is really the interesting part. So one of the things, sort of the idea I was talking to our army sponsor 
And then I was talking about what happens you know, if these machine learning techniques are attacked. And so he said he was very interested in that. And that's when I got Murat involved and Murat has just taken this and he has run away with it. He's doing some extremely good work. And so adversary modifies data to defeat the learning algorithms, right? So we have to understand the adversary. So why, why did I get into this area? This is not something that I was thinking about in 2010 or 2011. I was actually thinking about this problem as early as 1990, 1989, 1990. And no one was talking about applying game theory. OK, no one was talking about it at the time. So I had gotten a book on game theory and I was studying it and I felt that the, and I even wrote that in a technical report you know, as well as in a paper I thought I had published called handling inference problem with novel classes. So I was looking more not on, uh, you know, the inference problem where the adversary is trying to get as much information as possible from us, top secret information, but we are trying to prevent and giving thought the adversary, adversary is trying to thwart us. And so this was the inference problem where we are going back and forth and applying game theory. But at that time, I mean, people were talk, thinking like, actually, honestly, people were thinking that I was talking sort of like rubbish in the sense nobody was really believing. Uh, how is this, is this going to work? You know, you are not really going to play games. How, how long are you going to play games? What about the real world data? There's all the real world data that adversary can have or you can have. So that didn't really go far. So I was talking to this army sponsor and I told him that about this particular idea that I had about this adversarial, I didn't call it machine learning, adversarial based inference problem. And so then we had some discussions and he said that this is something he's quite interested if we can uh, apply it to machine learning. And so then I got Murat involved and then he wrote the one page and I uh, I sort of edited it and we sent that to him. And then the army sponsor was very interested. So I think Murat's been getting some funding in this area for the last, uh, since 2000, I think 2012, 11, 12, right? So adversarial machine learning, but the only problem is, you know, he was a pioneer. I think we were pioneers, but now everybody is doing this area, right? So, so essentially, Okay, so look, so we have, this is a support vector machine boundary. So we have these blue uh, blue circles, the good instances, the red squares are the bad instances, okay? So now look what happens. The adversary is trying to learn what we are doing, our models, our machine learning models. And then it's trying to thwart us so that now these red instances, red squares are looking, like I said, they are uh, good instances. OK, so now what to do is we have to learn what the adversary, adversary is doing. Yeah, we have to thought we have to thought what the adversary is doing. OK, so then the adversary over time learns our behavior and so it becomes game play. OK, so that is what is happening today. But again, as I said, in 19, 1989, 90, I was thinking the adversary is trying to attack and come up with knows exactly what the model we are using to extract information from us. OK, so that he can get top. So those days we were only concerned about secure secrecy. We didn't really care so much about integrity or anything else or availability, mostly secrets. Our secrets should not go out. In fact, when I used to go to database conferences and mention that people would just laugh at me and say, uh, I mean, don't you think integrity is important? So when I said, no, we are only concerned about secrecy because that was when we were doing cybersecurity, it was so ingrained into us. Secret, secret, secret should not go to the enemy. So, but the enemy can post lots and lots and lots of queries all over the, and then extract all the information, put it together and infer something that is highly classified. So the enemy is going to try and thwart us and extract the information. So then it becomes a game playing, which nobody really uh, believed at the time because they really said, oh, it's not going to work. OK, but over the years, I think they have learned a lot more and and people there are more people in the field and they have learned a lot more. So now game theory and cybersecurity, it's really a, a very hot area. OK, so this is what's happening, right? So the support vector machine line. So we try, what do we try? Using some mathematical computations, 
So a lot of these papers are heavy mathematics. You push the line to the blue line. So what happens, the red squares are the bad instances and the green circles are the good instances. So some of these uh, bad instances could be caught by moving the line. Otherwise, they will come across as good instances. <clears throat> okay, And that's what is happening here, if you can see. Right, so there are more things that are being caught. So of course you can ask the question, right? Why not move this right here? Then we can catch all the bad guys. But then that means all the green instances will show as bad instances. See, what we don't want is false positives and false negatives. And so our challenge is, where do you move? How far do you move this blue line? So black dash line is a standard support vector machine classification boundary and blue line is adversarial support vector machine classification boundary. And this paper was published in KDD in 2000, uh, I don't know, about six, seven, uh, 12, and then some series of other papers. I was involved in a couple of papers, but Murat and Yang Zhao, they have published several papers and they are quite well known in this area. But the only thing is there are others from Berkeley are really dominating the field okay so that's so that that's one thing that's uh, that's happening but this is going to be there forever so if you want to get into this sort of area i think there are a lot of opportunities here adversarial machine learning so this is just one chart i i threw out because that gave me a lot of visibility with the agencies and so we developed you know, we had a large project to develop the secure cloud so as part of the secure this was sort of mainly my work so if you look at uh, the, the, the different things, privacy, sort of I started that area, then Murat really took and ran away, data mining for cybersecurity, you know, I started the area, then Latifa really took it and ran away, so he's a big name. Adversarial machine learning, I started a little bit, but then Murat is the big name now. So this, I think all of us, but the idea here, and this, we had a, Air Force put out a press release on this and, you know, had my photograph and everything. Uh, and so we had multiple agencies. So this is US and this is uh, UK. So we said it was King's College. And this is University of Insubria, Italy. Elena, Barbara, our friends, Maribel, and the person who died, Steve, Bar uh, Steve Barker. So the guy, the people who are working here are logicians, right? Very, very uh, looking at the foundations. So what we did was we developed uh, some of the query processors and information sharing. Um, algorithms and systems and so we had multiple clouds there was no cloud in london we had a cloud here and we had a cloud in italy and so each of us will put our data in the cloud data and policies in the cloud okay and then we talk about sharing data so our cloud was really hadoop map reduce it was in the fourth floor of uh, uh, our ecs building and then we built a query processing the policy manager and so on these different components and so uh, we put all of our data and so on in the cloud and then agency one like you, dallas will ask london okay i want some data from you london will say okay i'll give the data from you provided you don't share it with italy or if i give the data from you you give me something else so we actually implemented and demonstrated it to uh, the air force uh, this was in Washington, D.C. We really demonstrated and we delivered the, the code. And we also published uh, some papers on the, in this area. And actually, there was a back in the old days means until like until Putin went into what's that country? Uh, not Crimea, right? The Crimea and Ukraine. Remember all those problems in 2014? Before that, every other year we had a conference. Air Force, U.S. Air Force had a conference in in St. Petersburg, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. And so all the generals and so on would go there and then they would, uh, you know, they would have, you know, this conference where, you know, present these papers, US part and the Russians and so on. So it was really, everyone liked going there because apparently St. Petersburg is really a beautiful, a beautiful city. So I was supposed to give a keynote address in 2012 um, you know, go to Russia and give a keynote address uh, on this research. And then, of course, my, my husband, Dr. T, got, you know, very nervous about going to Russia. So then I didn't want him to get a heart attack. So I said, no, I'll not go. And then my colleague, Dr. Latifa Khan, he went there and he gave the keynote address and talked about this work. 
Uh, and so this was very well received. So we pretended to be US, uh, UK and uh, and what's this, uh, Italy. So and then we demonstrated this system. OK, so now this whole thing, we are looking at the theory and that's the work I'm doing with King's College. Dr. Maribel Fernandez, uh, she's a logician. So we are doing some work to take our work here and formalize it. So I just wanted to mention that. OK, so. My last part of my first talk, remember both parts are really important and I sorry about the first few charts, but at least I showed you all what the pieces that you all were that we had missed. So developments and direction, some key points, right? Developments integrating cybersecurity and AI, right? So we know that it's really exploding. Data science, ML, it's all exploding, right? So our AI and machine learning, these are the technologies that everyone if for every application whether you talk about covid or banking or healthcare or anything we need that retail manufacturing they are using ai slash machine learning slash data science okay however what happens if these ai techniques and machine learning techniques are attacked right imagine with covid with uh, if, if these ai techniques are attacked and they are giving us all kinds of wrong information about the vaccines Right, it's going to be a disastrous situation. So that is really important. And applications for AI for inside a threat. So AI applied to cybersecurity and the AI techniques could be attacked. And of course, there is a privacy concern. So much data being collected and social scientists want to collect the data, the psychology so they can study about various groups of people. But privacy is a major concern. Um, oh, this is something somewhere else. So I have to, okay. So I had a very uh, a keynote address I gave recently where I applied some of the work to some of the things that Alvaro was doing on Internet of in Infrastructures, Internet of Things, and Internet of Transportation Systems. Okay, so that's a. Uh, so we have number of applications. So we I, we talked about the applications in the Internet of Transportation, autonomous vehicles, and so on. So these three I didn't really talk talk about this in, in this particular lecture. So again, can we develop a privacy aware policy based data framework for Internet of Transportation, Internet of Things? Now, and so what about trustworthy analytics? And again, there's a numerous opportunities for substantial research. So I would say AI machine learning, these are the hottest techniques right now. But of course, the disruptive, right? If, if if these techniques are attacked, so cybersecurity, I will say, is equally important because it can go and attack all of these techniques and so on, and then the results we are going to get from them are really useless. Now, my second part, I have only like five or six charts, which is equally important for this GRACE lecture series, is why are these, these research areas and so on, why are they so important for diversity and inclusion for different communities. So we talked about women. A lot, lot of my talks previously focused on women. OK, so this is really the first time and I'm going to participate in a panel, I believe August in October or November on diversity and inclusion. So for the first time, I think I'm including diversity and inclusion. So what is diversity? Multiculturalism, diversity, inclusion. There's also another term now, equity. Right, so I'm not going to go into all those details. Concept of multicultural and diversity, it encompasses acceptance and respect, recognition and valuing of individual differences. Right, diversity is defined as differences between people that can include dimensions of race, ethnicity. Always I get confused between race and ethnicity. They are different, but they are both, you know, usually talked about interchangeably right? Race and ethnicity. Of course, gender is very straightforward. Uh, sexual orientation, that's really important for us to take that into consideration. Socioeconomic status, uh, age, uh, physical abilities, you know, disabilities, our religious beliefs, our political beliefs. We want to include, you know, many, many people or other ideologies, multiculturalism refers to the existence of linguistically, culturally, and ethnically diverse segments in an organization. So I think over the years, especially for me, uh, you know, I come from a fairly conservative family. I grew up and 
you know, over the years, it, it was in the beginning, it was very hard because if I, you know, my parents, if I'd said, told my parents or something, I'm a lesbian woman or something, I think my father would have hit the roof and my mother would have probably disowned me. So it was that strict. But so I had sort of similar views, but over the years I become, I believe, a stronger supporter of diversity and inclusion, the LGBTQ community. So I think that we really, each one of us now really has to think about it more because we are really living in a multicultural environment. So coming back now, what is unique about in general cybersecurity and AI? So I gave some some information about sort of work that we are doing. As I said, they are more lucrative fields in computer science and they both have high income potential. OK, so cybersecurity, data science, AI researchers and developers, great demand, government, academia, industry, you name it. They want more and more folks with this expertise as well as other areas of computer science as well. Substantial funding with agencies, both in research and education, and this trend is expected to grow. Right, cybersecurity has been very steady and with reasonable substantial funding, but now AI and machine learning, you know, has superb funding right now. Women still make up less than 20% in many computer science fields. In cybersecurity, it is less than 10%. Right, and it depends. If you go to say data part of cybersecurity, it's more like 15. If you go to systems and hardware, it is more like five. And data science AI, I would say it's around 25%. Uh, percentage of underrepresented communities, and again, underrepresented communities, I would say African Americans, Hispanic Americans, uh, maybe even LGBTQ, you know, the percentage is even lower. And we know that cybersecurity AI, they are both intellectually challenging fields. OK, so why should uh, 10 reasons? Why should I mean, I don't think I'm giving 10 reasons. Oh, yeah, I, I am. Why should uh, cybersecurity data science for female and underrepresented communities? So number one, of course, I mean, these are I've been giving these talks for about three or four years now. Given the opportunity, women underrepresented communities can excel in any computing field and cybersecurity and data science are very exciting fields with so many innovations and developments happening so rapidly. So it can be integrated. Of course, machine learning can be integrated with arts, humanities, natural science, social science, engineering, business, medicine, law, and so on. Many options with research and academia to product development so it goes from research to academia product development and to startups and there is as i said lots of funding millennial women right and underrepresented communities and beyond have the flexibility right and i've given my life history so many times uh, and when i started off right back in 1980 40 years ago we it, things were not so flexible but now i think there's so much more flexibility that you know and now we know see we are all working from home these days right so especially for women in this particular case it's flexibility is really important especially they can have role models they can take care of children the babies and then also have great careers and so for us baby boomers we didn't really have all these role models and so especially for the women and underrepresented communities too because there are so few in many research areas, you can work from home most days, making it ideal, especially for women to have family and family and career. But that last point, we are doing it now after COVID. And many cybersecurity uh, and data science jobs, these are jobs cannot be overtaken by robots, right? Although I was reading somewhere, you can use now AI to do some of the cybersecurity jobs, right? So AI is really doing all of the automation. So you know, we need researchers and developers. So these are jobs that are really you know, good jobs that cannot be overtaken, right? Taken over by 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 robots. Cybersecurity, data science are highly paid fields, as I said, numerous job opportunities. So why not women and these underrepresented communities take advantage? And female underrepresented communities can be financially independent with a career in cybersecurity data science. And financial independence means self-respect, less stress and confidence. And I have said that over and over again at many talks when I talk to women. 
especially for women, I would say, right? And it's for everyone, but especially for women, uh, regardless of the background you come from, having financial independence is a must for every woman. That is something I've said, you know, you have to be able to not just support yourself and also be able to live comfortably. And that is really crucial because, you know, we, you, you hear about, right, women, you know, getting abused and uh, so many, so many issues that women have to uh, go through, right? So, uh, because we know that women are not as strong as men, men are stronger. So in any relationship, the stronger person has got the advantage. But if the woman has financial independence, I think the men are going to be more careful, right? In dealing with such a woman. So, or if the woman doesn't like to deal with such a man, she can just walk out anytime. So that, I believe, is really important for women. And so although it's important for underrepresented communities and for everyone, this is especially important for women. Computing systems are everywhere, north to south, east to west. Therefore, systems can be attacked. You can make the world a better and safer place with cybersecurity, including addressing the major problem of violence against women and children with technology. OK, so I think my last few charts uh, advice to all female and underrepresented communities. I'm telling them do not by, be undermined by others. That is when they say women and or minority communities, oh, they're not good in STEM. They can't do engineering. They should go and do music or singing or some history or something like that. Never give up when others and even women can put you down, right? So people are saying, oh, do you really want to do that? Do you think you can do that? I mean, these are comments I've heard people say, work hard, set goals, be flexible, as life does not turn out the way we want it to, especially, you know, with marriage and children. And, you know, there are there could be so many, so many challenges in life. So we have to be focused and flexible. So I made a, I did a podcast of women in STEM recently. So I was telling them, absolutely, you have to be focused these today, right? You cannot take detours. I took some detours in my career, but that was 40 years ago. It was different. Today, you really have to be focused. But at the same time, you have to be flexible because, right, because with marriage and children and so on. Love your work, enjoy life. Be a role model to younger women and those from underrepresented communities and learn from successful women. Even though you may get into administration, which is very important to support women, keep yourself technical. And I'm going to come back to that point about administration. OK, so for the senior people, right, support, you know, sometimes they say, especially women, they get to the top, they don't care about other women, okay? Support female underrepresented communities on issues of importance, tenure related matters, promotions, corporate boards, connect technologies from the female and underrepresented communities with senior personnel, both men and women, mentor female and underrepresented communities, give advice on career development, Promote female and underrepresented communities like ACM, IEEE Fellow, Venture Funding, Program Chairs, and so on. Promote female underrepresented communities to take on administrative positions. Very important so they can mentor junior. I'm going to come back to that point because it's really important. Introduce computer science education in elementary, junior, and senior high schools. We need more role models. And OK, before I come to this chart, uh, I just wanted to say something about, remember I mentioned, let me go back here, okay. I talked about we need more women in different uh, capacity, meaning, see, many women don't like to get into management. See, I was a, a manager, department head at MITRE, and I grew the department from 8 to 28. That means we got, I got to find work for all of them. It's not like getting a department in a, you know, managing a department in a university where the university pays. I don't have to find work for people in the department, if I'm a university department head. But then for me, I did. I, I was a good leader. Everyone, I mean, MITRE had a lot of high hopes for me, but I wasn't really happy doing all the management part, writing all the reviews. And so I went back to being technical. Um, and so uh, that was good for me, okay, because I felt that I was, I didn't want to do it. Don't, you know, you shouldn't force yourself. But if you have the aptitude, and if you really want to do it, you really have to push and get into it when you are young. Means become a department head. Only if you have many department heads, women, can you select from there, you can become a dean, right? 
if there are only two women and 20 men, right, as department heads, and if you want to select a dean, of course the dean position very likely will go to one of the 20 men because the, there's a pool for the women much smaller. So you need to have many first level managers. From there, you can go to the second level. From there, you can go to the third level, vice presidents and provosts. And from there, you can become CEOs and presidents. So you really need to start young because you need to have a larger pool. That is sort of the message I want to give for not only women and for uh, underrepresented communities too, especially when you look at African-Americans in computer science, that is really dismal. I can count with my fingers how many African-American uh, professors there are in, in computer science. Very, very few. OK, so we have a lot of role models section, not a whole lot, but let's at least look at them, right? We are all in computer science and the greatest person we have is Alan Turing from the LGBTQ community and the poor, poor Alan Turing, right? Because he was from that LGBTQ community, he was really harassed by the British government and they really tortured him so that so much so he committed suicide. But I'm so glad that he was there because he gave us computer science and we are all now celebrating him, giving the biggest award. Okay, so that, you know, we have Alan Turing to thank for. And then programming, Countess Ada Loveless. If you read her life history, she worked under very difficult conditions. Her father didn't want her because he wanted a boy. Then she and her mother went somewhere else. And there she studied mathematics. And so she gave us programming. Of course, Admiral Grace Hopper. And this is a great series named after Admiral Hopper. And we're all I'm looking forward to going to GHC later this month. And then we have actress Hedy Lamar. Right. Nobody thinks of her. I mean, she's one of the most gorgeous, beautiful actresses. But then she gave us wireless, right? The beautiful and brilliant Miss Lama. She gave us wireless and not all of them are in STEM, right? So I wanted to. So when you look at African-American women, I was thinking about people with I need to do, do more research there. African-American men and women who have been sort of brilliant scientists and so on. I'm sure there are. But some names I found in other areas, of course, we have Oprah Winfrey, right? There's no one a stronger motivator to women, I would say, than Oprah Winfrey. She's a self-made billionaire and she's a role model for all of us. And of course, we have Serena Williams is going to give the keynote address at the Grace uh, Hopper celebrations. And so I was watching a match earlier today. She won, which is really great. She is, all the people say, you know, Serena versus Margaret Court. Uh, but Serena to me is the greatest of all times because again, Margaret Court was, you know, pre-professional time. She played in the 60s, but Serena has been in the open era. So she's really great. These are people that we have to learn from. And UTD, we can learn from our UTD role models as well, right? We have our provost, Dr. Inga Musselman, and we have our Dean of Engineering and Computer Science, Dr. Stephanie Adams. Not only she's a woman, but she's also a woman of color. So we are very fortunate. And I noted that our Dean of Graduate Education is Dr. Juan Gonzalez. So we have some people at UTD that we can look up to. So I think summary is my last chart. Uh, thanking everyone and please contact us for anything technical or other parts. So and again, what I wanted to say was, you know, there's so much going on. It's such a great time for us to be here, even though there is COVID and so on. Because of computing, we are able to work from home. As I say in my STEM podcast, I mean, most of us would have gone bankrupt if we did not have technology for us to conduct all these meetings, for me to give this keynote. I mean, the Gray Series kickoff talk. So we are living in a very Although it's a very difficult time for us at this time, hopefully these vaccines will, you know, give us some solution. Although news is not very good. I heard some not so good news yesterday about this one particular vaccine I was banking on. But in any case, we are living in a very exciting time with respect to technology and we need everyone to participate because when we have diverse groups of people, right, they bring value. 
And that's what we need to understand. When we have diversity, then each one can be, he or she brings his own perspective. And if you are willing to listen to what the other person has to say, then we can make this, uh, you know, our work and technology and everything so much more exciting and so much more rewarding and we can produce even better results. That's why diversity is so important. Going beyond women include different cultures and different people. And so to have this diverse community. So in the end, we can all benefit. And those of us who are parents and grandparents, we really have to instill that in our children because so that they also learn about diversity. Unfortunately for me, because I, you know, we are first generation immigrants, right? We were not growing when we grew up. You know, there were a lot of problems in many of our countries. There were racial tensions and religious tensions. So we were not really trained about diversity. But now we have this great opportunity. People are talking about diversity. Look at all these people that we have you know, the role models, I can I could have named so, so many more people. So we are really at a very, very exciting time. You know, we have to just hope and pray that this COVID will be gone in a, in a year or so, so that we can all, you know, get back together and celebrate, celebrate our diversity and celebrate and really, you know, be excited about the technologies. I talked about AI, data science, cybersecurity, because that those are the areas I've been working, but even software engineering and networking, there are so many areas in computer science that we can, you know, work together and, uh, and uh, you know, work on technology and at the same time build this diverse community. So that is my talk. Uh, let's see. So sh I'm going to stop sharing. OK, so what else, Pushpa? I hope this was an interesting talk. So so we would like to thank Dr. Bhavani for her excellent talk because she beautifully combined the technical aspects of security with data science and also spoke about diversity and inclusions with lots of words of her wisdom. So please give a round of applause for her for taking the time and effort to come and talk in this series. And we can applaud her using the raise hands, I believe. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, the floor is open. Please feel free to ask uh, Dr. Bhavani your questions. OK, so everyone is raising hands. Karen Doer is the first one to go. So Karen. Well, I'm raising hands to just say this was fantastic. Thank you so much. It was just wonderful, really beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Karen. Dr. Farooq Bastani has a question. No, no, same thing. Just to say raising it's awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani Turasinga. Thank you, Dr. Bastani. Thank you also for pointing that we were. I sorry, I made this mistake. I didn't go into the desktop and share. So. Anyway, oh, no, thank you that, very much. that happened in my class one day. So now every time I start, I ask students, can you see the next slide? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've learned my lesson. Yeah. Thank you. I think Michelle, Michelle has a hand up. Michelle? Oh, Karen has a hand up. Karen? Thank you, Bhavani. It's always so exciting to me to listen to anyone talk about their field that they're so passionate about. So I could really hear the passion in your presentation for your technical knowledge. And I just want let, to let you know that I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much, Karen. And thanks for all the work that you and uh, you know, Karen Mazidi, Karen Doe and Pushpa, all of you all are doing for women and uh, computing and so on at uh, UT Dallas. Real great service, yeah. It's our pleasure. Yeah. And any, any other, oh, DT? I think DT, DT has his hand up. Okay. Thank you for a beautiful talk, Bhavani. So what is your plan for the next five years? Oh, gosh. <laughs> next five years, I want, okay, it's a very, very interesting question, DT, yeah. 
So I really want to continue more because we have to keep our technical work sort of there because otherwise, you know, so, so focusing on technical work, I think I mentioned to you, maybe get back into theory a little bit. I started off with theory, maybe do that a little bit, theory, maybe develop maybe technologies for COVID. So I really want to continue with that. But I really want to also pursue, do more, because last five years I've done some, but increase that a lot more and hopefully work with Karen the two Karens and Pushpa and others to do things more for women in cybersecurity, women in data science. OK, and go beyond women. I'd like to also include diversity and inclusion. So go and talk to LGBTQ communities, go and talk to African-American communities. I was I got an award from an African-American community in 19 in 2001 called Career Communications Group reconnect with that group right hispanic american communities so you know get to those communities and reach out to them so i believe that i have my work really cut out for me for the next five years part of it technical part of it lot of outreach at least i'd like to do it more 50 50 right so 50 50 would be a bit hard i would say because i need to do the teaching and research and so on at least 70 30 so 30 percent of my time I want to so like in, I'm going to be on the diversity and inclusion panel and there are different different things. Computer society, I'm doing some women in STEM and so there are little 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 efforts that I'm going to be involved and how does it all come together? That's a question. So I don't think about what's going to happen. Let's do little things because the way I look at it, DT, you do little things and in the end it will all come together. Right when I started doing, you know, women stuff, right? I started again in 1999, the first time. I was doing very little. And then 2014, 15, I ramped up. But suddenly now I go and look back, it's all sort of coming together. So maybe continue with this for the next five years and see how it all comes together. So something I'm realizing recently, uh, DT and everyone else, because whatever we do, uh, it's not like as if it's going to not be of use, right? So do something that you like, not to get a name out there. Do something you have, because people will see through. If you are sort of pretending, I think people can see through. So you've got to be authentic. You've got to be genuine. That's really important, you know. So otherwise people can see through. So just do the things that you want to do when you are happy doing, and then it's all going to come together and other people will recognize you because when I started actively in 2014-15 I did not uh, realize like six years later there was like ACM would do a column on me like IEEE is doing a large article I did not think that way but then they people start noticing if you are genuine and really passionate about things others will start noticing and then now through the IEEE article, I'm hoping I can reach to reach out to so many people. So another thing we are also thinking is doing some talk, give some talks in Nigeria and Kenya. So that's something Latifa and I are talking about uh, so that we can, you know, maybe you know, take some turns and give some tutorials. But then more than Nigeria and Kenya, we also have the African American community in the United States that we need to do more for them. So those are the outreach things that we are we are planning to do. Sounds like a great plan and I appreciate your enthusiasm in energy. Oh, thank you. And I, I have to really thank uh, uh, thank UT Dallas, my colleagues. DT, you hired me and you really motivated and Gopal, you were really wonderful the next several years. So you know, hopefully whoever the new department head is, you know, he or she will continue to keep this going. What DT and Gopal have done, you know, keep this momentum going. Very important. So hopefully we can find such a department head. So I think uh, there are no more questions, Bhavani. Yeah, so thank you. It's a good time to conclude this presentation and we thank you once again for your time. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.
Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, it was bye -bye. very intimate and I'm very happy. Thank you. So I'm going to leave now, okay? Bye. 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 Thank you again. Thank you.